So I uh, appreciate everybody joining in. Uh, I see some people still kind of give some people some more time. So I think we'll do a quick warm up icebreaker today before we get started. Uh, so here, here's mine. Let me see if I can share my screen here for the icebreaker. Uh, can everybody see my slides? Okay. So here's the question. You can um, place your flag, whatever camp you're in. Uh, how do you pronounce this word? Do you say data or data? And so I'm just curious on your take on this. Uh, there is no right or wrong. Well, there might be a right or wrong answer. I'm just not sure, but I'm just interested in, in how people pronounce this. So maybe want to take the opportunity. Do you, want pick, do you want to pick an emoji and say, if this is this, then that? <laughs> <laughs> we can. So what's everybody's what's everybody's take on this one today? I go with data and I, I have a feeling that people from UK and that side they say data or Indians, but I um I go with data. Okay. Anybody else? I think I used to say data. But since I moved here, at some point I started saying data. I don't remember when. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Who else? I think I used both, and I just don't have any good reason to use one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I definitely Depends. use both. Depends on the context, I suppose. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with data. I'm 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 using the day version of it. Data. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> Same. I am more of a, a data person, but I have a lot of people at work say data. And so it depends on who I'm talking to, but I will say data more often than not. So I didn't know, is anybody like strongly against using one? I know I've come across some people that are, that are strongly against it. It wasn't, there's a Star Trek character that's data, right? It's in the newer, the newer versions of Star Trek. And I think that's probably what I got stuck on uh, in that in that manner. Hmm. I think it also goes with like professionals too, or people who work in in data. You know, they 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 kind of hold that more strongly of what the how they pronounce it. But outside, you know, most people kind of just use whatever. So I don't know. I was, I was curious to kind of uh, to see what people would say about this. Um, I had this. Someone asked this in a webinar the other day, and I was like, I don't really know. I think it's data for me. So. Um, cool. Excellent. So I appreciate everybody joining in. We're already at 8.06. So I'll kind of quickly run over a few reminders and then we'll kind of talk about what we're going to discuss for this evening. Um, just a few reminders. Again, um, most of you have already been in a session, so I don't need to go in depth with these. But again, if we if we need to slow down and discuss, just let me know. You know, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you want to stop and discuss further. Um, we're here all to learn. So if something, you know, if somebody wants to comment on something or correct in any way, please do. Um, camera is optional, but encouraged. You know, obviously, I want to be uh, concerned about your privacy and your and your uh, comfort during the session. And then um, make sure that you understand that these sessions are recorded. Um, but like I said, most of you pretty much know this already. So just a quick reminder for anybody who might be new, or just a, just a quick reminder. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to finish chapter two. I'm going to take about 10, 15 minutes to fly through the rest of chapter two. Then we'll transition over to Ryan to discuss chapter three. And maybe, Ryan, you give me a thumbs up or not, maybe start the discussion of chapter four. Um, I have looked at the schedule a little bit for what people have already signed up. Um, so if we do have to shift this around, just let me know if there's going to be any issues. I know Rex, you've uh, graciously decided to take chapter five. So if we do have to do some shifting around, let me know if those dates no longer work for you and we have to kind of figure it out and stuff. So um, I really appreciate everybody. Um, you know, it's really encouraging to see all the people signing up for this. So I really appreciate the group doing that. So um, it's great to see that we're already up to chapter eight in coverage. So I really appreciate everybody doing that. So let me get started so we can get through chapter two so we could move on and start talking about um, some other content for tonight. And I'm sure many of you are probably tired of already hearing me talk for two sessions already. So I don't want to dominate this one. 
Um, but last time we were talking about the this kind of example package that was put together by Jenny Bryan, um, this regex excite package. It's just a toy package to kind of go through like the entire process of how to create a package using some of the tools that we'll use and discuss throughout the book. And so I'll reference this a little bit today as I kind of finish up this chapter number two. So where we left off, we were talking about licensing. Um, we discussed a little bit about just pick a license. Uh, we'll get into this in more depth in chapter nine. But the big thing to highlight with this was using the, the use this, use license, and to choose the actual license that you want to use. Um, if you're first getting off the ground, basically the chapter suggests just pick, pick a license. And then, you know, if you need to make any changes, that will be discussed in chapter number nine. Colin, we talked about doc. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, with, with your permission, do you mind if uh, you increase the font size just by oh. one, one scale? Yeah, certainly. Sorry, yeah. for the YouTubers. Thanks, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and we talked about documenting functions. We talked really about how it's... Uh, how Roxygen 2 is kind of the, the, the system that kind of sets this all up. We talked about how Roxygen comments are created. Uh, we talked about that there's that function uh, document that actually creates the .rd files that are stored in the man directory and so on and so forth. And I think we left off at the namespace. Um, the namespace file really kind of is setting up um, what types of functions and what objects you want to make available to your users when they actually install and attach your package. And so um, the namespace file is a file that we really don't edit by ourselves. Um, this is a file that gets developed from Roxygen 2 and through the types of directives and, and tags that we add to our Roxygen skeleton. And so basically, it's just good to know that this file exists, but you're not going to hand edit it. Um, and we're going to get and there's a chapter devoted specifically to the namespace file. So I'm not really going to dig too deep into what this does and how it works, but just know it's a file that allows us to export objects for our users to use once they install and attach the package. Uh, so it contains the functions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the export directive and the Roxygen 2 skeleton when we get there, especially within, I think, chapter number eight. Um, when we talk about object documentation, but um, we'll get to that sooner rather than later. Uh, and so we talked about installing the package for the first time. Uh, so we talked about the load all kind of function. So if we want to do like a quick test drive of our functions, what we can do is we can do the load all function. Uh, again, the key binding of that was shift command, um, shift command L or control. Uh, control shift L for my Windows people. And basically that was giving us the ability to quick practice and see if our functions were actually working. But if we want to go through that process of seeing what it's actually like for users once they install and install and attach our package, we can run this install function and then do a library on the package name to actually attach it and then kind of use our, our functions to see what it would be like if our package was actually installed. Now, when we get to chapter four and it talks about the different states that our package can take, we'll get into more of that discussion of the difference between installing your package versus attaching your package and, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to dig too much into that um, beyond this little discussion here. And then the book kind of talks about testing your package. Um, we'll get to this again, so I'm not going to dig too deep into it, but really this discussion was kind of talking about, well, what if you want to set up your testing framework? What are some of those use this functions that we can use to just get that set up? And so the first one was this use test that, which actually sets up your testing framework so you can write formalized units tests for your functions. And so basically all that function does is when you run the use, use this test that function, um, what it's going to do is it's going to set up this extra directory called tests within your package structure. And it's also going to set up this um, subdirectory test that. And then it's going to add this file test that that's going to direct which tests are actually going to be run with your package. And then you get um, access to functionality with the use test function from use this. Excuse me, use this. And then it will give you use test. You run this, what it will do is it will set up a test file for your specific functions that you want 
in your testing framework that you want to set up. Really nice feature of this use test is uh, if you have an active file that's open. So last time we created, I created this function called create date file name that I wanted to add to the package. When I, when I run use test, and this is my active file, what's nice about it is you don't have to provide the file name. It will just automatically create the test file for you. So again, last time I referenced last time, last time I referenced that there's just kind of these like little nice things that these like workflow functions provide to us. And so this is one of those things that it's just kind of one of those nice little things that somebody thought about that usually when you run use test, it's good to have that kind of active file um, and then just create that test file from that. But again, there is an argument within it that if you do want to provide the specific file name for it, it's available to you to modify that however you want. Um, I'm not going to get too big into the test that I created for this create date file name, but basically this is what a test will, uh, this is what like a, a unit test will look like. You don't need to know too much about what's going on here because we'll talk more about testing, but basically it gives you the ability to set up what your expectations are uh, for your function and then formalize those expectations to test what you expect versus the output of your specific functions within your package. But again, within that like 10 second description, there's more to that. And so, um, but I just kind of want to reference that, you know, that's what use test, uh, test that does and what use test does. It helps you set up that framework or sets up your testing framework without having you to manually change those things. Um, okay, so we talked about a little bit about check, running our command check. Um, again, I'm not an expert on that. I know Rex provided a little bit more information about that, um, but we'll get into that in more depth a little bit on, a little bit further on in our reading. So um, using functions from other packages. Uh, so sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's better to not reinvent the wheel. Sometimes it's better to import functions that are already defined for us. Um, so basically, if we want to do that, we have to set it up for our package to set up those dependencies for us. And so if we want to uh, actually use other functions from other packages, we need to declare this in our imports section of our description file. And so if you look at a description file, and I highly suggest doing this if you're not familiar with package development, is to start digging into some description files of other packages to see how things are set up. But um, what's really nice about this uh, use package function from use this is it automatically sets up our imports within the description file of our package. And so say, um, and the book kind of talks about adding, uh, using some functions from string R in this, in this string split one function. And so to actually use that, we need to declare that dependency for our package. And to do that, we use that workflow kind of function to set that up for us. We'll talk about how to refer to these specific um, functions from other packages as we get into, I think, the R file chapter. Um, but we'll talk more about that. We'll talk about different ways to do um, import of these specific functions from other packages using our Roxygen skeleton. But if you want to use other functions from other packages, you're going to have to set those dependencies up. And how you do that is you use this use package function from use this. Um, there's some other utility functions that are also really nice. Like if you are in a situation where you need to rename files, there's this rename files function. I haven't really used it, but I haven't gotten to the situation where I do need to do a lot of renaming of files. But um, those functionalities are provided to you. And then we talked a little bit about um, the ability for some functions to modify your tests. And then there's some other functions out there, you know, document and load all again to make sure once you change your oxygen skeleton, it changes the document files for you, sets up those .rd files, and then that load all to, you know, test drive your functions and use them. Uh, then the last, kind of the last big bit from this was a readme file. Uh, your readme file is really important, especially if you're going to host it on a um, online repository like GitHub, uh, Bitbucket, or GitLab. Um, basically, this is the welcome mat to your package. Uh, it's kind of one of the first things that users will come across. Um, to set this up, 
What's really nice is instead of using a readme.md file, what you can do is you can set up a readme.rmd file. Use this provides a convenience function. Use readme.rmd that will create this within your package. So you can create your readme file uh, in, in, in our markdown rather than doing it in markdown. Uh, in the background, if you do use this function to set up your readme file, it will do some stuff in the background to make sure that when you build your package and before you push it up into that GitHub repository, it will tell you, hey, you need to knit this RMD file so that it can convert it over to that .md file. And so um, this is just a great way to kind of set this up. It provides that convenience of being able to create your um, readme.md file from this R markdown kind of syntax. Uh, again, when it comes to your readme file, this is the, a great opportunity for you to describe the purpose of your package, you know, what, what types of problems does it solve. It provides just general installation instructions, and then it really highlights a bit of usage. And the book really kind of talks about, um, you know, you know, don't, don't be very comprehensive in your readme. Give some like, it's like a quick start guide to get your users up and running. And then the other thing is, is that when you do do this, make sure you build your README with build README. If you do forget this before you actually build your package and push it up to your repo, um, if you did the use README uh, underscore re RMD function, it will remind you to do that. So there's some convenience in doing that. Last thing uh, the book talks about is before you um, push this to version control, check it, install it, um, attach it, kind of uh, work through, uh, you know, test your functions, see if they're working as you expect it. Um, that check is going to run the RMD check. It's also going to run your tests for you. And then it's just a good opportunity to get that feedback, fix any issues that you have, and then do the commit and push. And so um, these are kind of like the final two things that you should do before you push your package into version control. And so um, I know that was the last couple sections of the of the chapter in about 15 minutes. Um, so, but again, we're gonna come to most of this material throughout the rest of the book. And so um, there's no use in deep diving in each one of these until we get to it. So what questions do people have about what we discussed? Um, any comments? Did I get anything wrong? Going once. I get the thumbs up from Rex, so I'm going to take that. All right, cool. Well, that's uh, chapter two. I think we'll make the transition over to Ryan. And, and Ryan, I'll let you have the floor. So I'll stop my share and we'll switch on over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. All right. So quickly, let's do a screen share. And I am going to share my desktop two. Um, if I I'm hoping I don't have to switch over to our studio, but um, what I find happening is there's a tendency for in Zoom to only share a program and not the actual desktop. So um, if I happen to switch gears and nobody sees the screen change, please let me know. Um, we are going to be talking about chapter three and the title of this particular chapter is going to be system setup. Now, I tried to follow as closely to the text of the document in relation to spelling, uh, use of terms, uh, different highlighting text, etc. Uh, again, I'm using the online version of the document. I don't have a print version. Um, so there are going to be a couple of points where I've condensed the hyperlinks uh, when I post this or, or call in when I, when I push, uh, uh, create a pull request uh, to the uh, cohort three. Uh, hopefully we'll get access to those URLs and you'll get to see the full extension. The uh, online textbook does make direct reference to those longer URLs. Uh, so there isn't anything changed uh, with relation to that. The learning objectives for chapter three is going to be how to check which version of R in RStudio you're using. Now I expanded on this particular learning objective. Uh, the text just says, make sure that you're up to date and follow those instructions. And it doesn't really guide you on how to achieve it. Uh, so I went ahead and included a couple of steps. One of which is the use this uh, package that will validate uh, one of those uh, points.
Uh, we talk about discovering or using the dev tools package. Uh, dev tools is going to be uh, split into seven different subcategories um, with the use this being the primary of kind of orchestrating everything. Um, there's a difference between regular use ours or users of uh, our studio and then those that are uh, taking that opportunity for being in development mode. We learn about the use this package, can I mention that, and then understanding the distinct difference. There is a very big difference between uh, common users of our studio and those that choose to be developers because we often access a little bit more intricate uh, details of how our studio operates. Uh, so there is a difference when you start using dev tools, it gives you a lot more command. Okay. Any questions on learning objectives at all? So Colin, the comment of uh, going forward into chapter four, my intent or hope is that we do not go beyond the uh, our build ignore file, uh, our build ignore uh, section uh, within chapter four. Uh, I haven't went past that point. So uh, I am saving a little bit more time for uh, next week. Rex, if that's okay with you, uh, given the date and time. So the first thing that we're going to do is prepare our system. Now, to prepare the system, we want to do a couple of validation checks. The entry to this comment is that each one of us may have different uh, installed packages or installed our studio, our code. Uh, we may be even working in a, a cloud-based orientation. The idea would be you want to get that base setting down first. And once I get past this, we're going to talk about uh, being able to update and, and get to the most uh, future release concepts, daily re release type concepts. So to do this, we're going to just run a quick R version uh, uh, function. When this uh, spit out, uh, for me, it kind of extended into this larger um, output. Uh, uh, the example in the book is a little bit more condensed. Uh, it removes all of these um, extra uh, variable values, et cetera. But uh, what we're looking for is the platform, the architecture, the operating system, uh, what system you're using, the status of the system, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm on a MacBook. Uh, in this particular case, this is a 2015 uh, MacBook. So I'm a little bit dated. I have not graduated to the M1 series. Um, my primary uh, environment that I often work in is obviously Linux, uh, but I'll go back and forth between the two. I do have our studio on my Windows computer, um, but I don't use it as often as I should. Um, I usually try to avoid Windows in most cases. So um, if you are happen to be a Windows user and you have particular questions, I am here to help, uh, but I may not be as committed to that operating system as, as others. Okay, scroll down here a bit. The one listed item that we want to do or want to see is this version string. Now, currently, uh, RStudio, or the R version, is at uh, 4.1.3, uh, so I'm a little bit outdated, and this was based on a knitter package, so it is pulling uh, my active uh, environment that I'm working in, so it would tell me at this stage I should update both R and RStudio to be a little bit more, not bleeding edge, but just a little bit more closer to the activity of, of where RStudio is currently. The other option that we can run, so again, I'm just going to scroll up here for a moment. I used an R version function. The other option that we could follow would be the session info option. Now, session info is actually part of the use this package. So this is going to give the information in a slightly different form, but ultimately um, it's going to be closer to what Colin was referring to in these kind of more automated or, um, no, I don't want to say intricate, but they're going to be more better suited for package development in general. Okay, So again, it's repeating the R version is 4.1.1. My platform is uh, Apple Darwin 17, uh, running Mac OS Big Sur. Uh, Colin, I think you and I had spoke about this in a previous uh, cohort about your version of OS that you were running. I was going to say, I mean, you're on Big Sur. I mean, I'm on Monterey. So like I'm already is on that my version. 12, I think. But no, I can't. No, no, no. I'm not very good with Mac OS uh, naming convention. Is Monterey newer than that? Well, the major version is 12. Well, the one I'm running is 12.2.1, but oh, okay. it, it might be most. Does anybody have an updated version of Mac right now that they're running? It's not that big a deal. I was just 
Just wondering. I was gonna say you're still running Big Sur. That's 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 a little behind. Is it okay? Well, uh, I haven't. I uh, this uh, computer was purchased in 2017, so um, and I have not made an attempt or plans of of purchasing another MacBook at this moment. Um, it, again, if we switch back over to Linux, I'd probably be a little bit more bleeding edge. Um, and I also do have a uh, an R Studio Connect um, server side R Studio that I also work with. It's agnostic to operating systems as well. I think, I think just to add to that, which is like, you know, why discussing this is like, it's really important to have mm -hmm. like the, up, like the most updated system, right. Or the updated operating system and, and version you can have. Uh, I say that because it depends on your situation, but like in most cases, it's good to have the most updated version. Um, Cause I, one experience that I have is was I, I teach a class that we use R in our studio and it's, always amazes me to see what version students are running on their laptops yeah. um, because uh, you know it four semesters ago and, and haven't really thought about it since yeah they've never shut it down ever <laughs> and good point so they bought they bought their computer four years ago and and so um and so you got to remind them like shut it down do the updates and then exactly. things will be a lot more smooth for you so well, with this, uh, with this particular session info, uh, it also lists uh, various packages that are also installed as well, and it will make recommendations uh, if you need to update. So that's another option as well. Uh, I'll talk about that here uh, in just a little bit. I said, okay, so this was fun, but the version check isn't in the book. And I wanted to make a highlight about that uh, in chapter three. It immediately uh, jumps into doing this install packages and then dev tools, Roxygen, test that, and Knitter. Um, this two previous points that I had up above, I wanted to throw those in there if anybody happens to watch this at a later point. Um, I'm always caught uh, behind the eight ball of Google searching what exactly a command is so that I can run it. Um, or I have this itch in the back of my mind that says, I know I've learned about this, but I can't remember what it was. So um, just for my own purposes, putting that in there. Uh, we need to follow the author, right? So that's what I'm trying to do is pull us back into following the text. Uh, let's load some packages to prepare for authoring some packages. So uh, the uh, reference that we make here is install packages uh, with a, a concatenation or a, or a list, uh, dev tools, Roxygen 2, test that, and knit R. Okay. Uh, for me personally, when I did this, uh, it went into an infinite loop of, do you want to restart R? Yes, I do. Uh, try to load the packages. We need to reset R. Yes, go ahead and restart it. Uh, it went into this infinite loop of me selecting yes and just it restarting and giving me the same command over again. As soon as I selected no, it went ahead and installed the packages. So uh, for the purposes of, of my own uh, intent, if you do happen to run into that, just select no and it'll install what you need to. Okay. The author recommends increasing the preview or to the preview version of our studio, the integrated development environment or IDE. We are considering ourselves developers, right? That's me kind of making a comment to ourselves. This whole package development book club is intended to be in this more development mindset. So with that said, go ahead and update to that preview version. Uh, usually this isn't needed or required for a common user. Uh, what Colin was mentioning about those older uh, versions of R that are out there uh, where you'll run into is just conflict, package conflicts. You'll try to run a command and it doesn't exist or load a package and you'll have to update a bunch of other stuff as well. Uh, it does put you in a position uh, where you could be subject to bugs if you do uh, the daily build. Um, but it is at that bleeding edge moment. So if the uh, RStudio team developers are releasing new versions of IDE, uh, there is always going to be an intent, uh, an intent that there will be bugs created. And uh, with that thought in mind, uh, those users that are developers are usually a little more prone to management of those bugs or trying to correct them. Uh, they're gonna be a little bit more active on asking questions or posting bug fixes. There is two links here that I have uh, for both the preview version and the released version. Um, if you do want to go check those out, they will be available. Uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, uh, the book does give the longer version of the URL. Uh, so if you're more confident and want to copy and paste that, you can. Okay. Anybody have any questions before the next section at all? In my research of this particular chapter, there was a reference made to the DevTools splitting. It happened in 2018, and the comment I made to myself or to the team was, at some point in your development career, you're going to find you need to reorder or, or just come to a, a stop and 
think about where you're at and possibly reorganize things to, to move to the next level. And that's kind of what happened in this, this dev tools uh, package. The developers, Jenny Bryan, uh, uh, Hadley Wickham, uh, there was another person that was posting uh, material and he may also be a maintainer, but as a collective whole, they decided, let's go ahead and split this. Let's pause or let's break these out into smaller segments and then maintain those smaller packages uh, as a collective under this DevTools umbrella. I did list out what those seven packages were. It's the remotes package, package build, package load, uh, uh, R command check, R uh, rev, uh, rev, dependency check, session info, and then use this. And Colin, you in chapter two spent quite a bit of time talking about the use this package. Um, that's actually where most of this chapter three is, is uh, uh, taking most of the material from. Uh, what's cool here is we've already used one of these packages and that was the session check uh, or session info command that I, I made. So that was already part of this. Um, you can think of the dev tools as a wrapper and it provides the ability to set your user-friendly defaults. Uh, Colin made a reference earlier uh, about these uh, kind of intricacies that have already been managed for us using the DevTools package. Uh, it introduces helpful interactive behavior. We'll, we're gonna see this here in a little bit uh, where I have a code chunk and uh, an expected output. You'll see that for me, it, at least it ran a couple of uh, red flags, both my RStudio being behind and a couple of the packages being behind. It also combines functionality for multiple sub packages. There is a difference, again, between the users and the developers. Primarily, users should attach dev tools and think of it as a provider for your favorite functions of package development. Many of us, or I presume that many of us, have probably been reading some forum post or some vignette or, or a reference that says, hey, go to DevTools, uh, uh, install GitLab or GitHub, and then some package name. Well, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're kind of accessing more of the bleeding edge version of that package uh, when you are making that particular call. We as developers, again, are going to be at more of that bleeding edge kind of moment. We're actively assisting or helping in building packages. Okay. Uh, developers uh, should not, should not depend on dev tools, but should instead access functions via the package that is the primary home. For example, dev tools should rarely appear in the role of foo in a qualified call um, where the form is uh, the package name and then the function call. Instead, foo, the package, uh, should be the package where the function is defined. As an exception to this, and this is where I mentioned the install GitHub. So as an exception is when we continue to the feature DevTools install GitHub uh, as the way to install the, read, uh, install the development version of the package in its readme. If required, ensure your report bugs to each sub package. This last comment uh, within this particular section or this topic they were making a, co a comment that says, if you're going to raise a bug for one of these sub packages, make sure that you're dedicating it to that sub package. If you report it to dev tools, it may get lost in translation or it may get lost in, in uh, access. So be specific. If you do discover a problem within one of these, make sure that you're reporting it back to that sub function itself or sub package itself, okay? Examples of how to simulate installing and loading packages in the interactive development mode. So for example, we call libraries dev tools, uh, and this is loading required package, use this. So this is actually a code that ran on this computer uh, when I was uh, uh, knitting or, or producing the HTML output. So my report said loading required package, use this. You could also say load all, which I think the I stands for information, uh, I've never seen this character show up in my uh, interactive terminal before uh, or console, I guess, but it popped up with this uh, kind of lower subscript I. Uh, it says loading book clubs are packages. So our book clubs are managed by John uh, Harmon. I have reason to believe that when I made this call within the NIT R uh, uh, access, what it did is it went back in this script and said, oh, we're going to update or, or we're going to load the book club, our packages in here, because that's the name of our, our uh, repo. Does any, Colin or anybody, do you want to jump in and make sure that I'm not mis 
conveying that statement. Let me let me say it this way. I think what happened when you use the word load all is it's going back to its uh, is it namespaces or the uh, Colin, you just made a comment about it a moment ago with the uh, chapter two uh, towards the very end. It's the list of dependencies. So it made a call to that dependency and said, I'm going to load this as well. Well, I think I think with the load all it it refreshes your session. I think is what is it that is. It? So okay. I think it restarts your session. And so if you have that near our markdown and it's going to evaluate it, it's going to clear your session. Okay. And so if you load all, I think that's what it is. Very good. Um, and then too, like that little I, yes. I can't remember the package that they're using. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think our Lang is the one that allows you to output like messages with like different characters to like signify like information issues. I don't know if it's our Lang. I'm someone correct me if I'm wrong. I'm trying to find it right now, but we like the check marks there's a specific and the, package. Yeah, the check marks and the and the kind of the stoplight blue green or sorry green red. I'm gonna I'm gonna correct myself. The okay. package is All called right. CLI. I CLI. I think is the one I'd have to double check the source code, but yeah, I think it's CLI. Very good. Sorry. So somebody correct me if I'm uh, The last statement here is that if you used, uh, sorry, if used inside in our package, uh, the intended call, uh, if you were to define it, is uh, going to be a package load and then load all. So what we're doing is calling on the uh, original package and then the function of load all. And then again, it reported the same output is my point here when I made both either one of those. Okay, so my association to reading the chapter and implying what exactly they're conveying here. I think the first, uh, first function call was a common user, whereas the second call, if you're doing this within a package development concept, you would use the package load and then load all instead. So they're, they're comparing um, the common users versus the developer side. And if I interpreted that incorrectly, uh, feel welcome to uh, pause there too. All right, moving on. So now we get into the personal startup configuration. Now we're gonna make some uh, references to the R profile. Uh, initially, when I was uh, writing this uh, presentation, I did not have an R profile. I was asking the question of where does it store it at? Normally, anything that starts with a dot uh, pre uh, prefix is going to be a hidden file. And you usually have to, uh, within a Windows environment, uh, explicitly ask the system, the folder explorer, uh, to uh, show hidden files, or if you're in a Linux or a Mac environment, uh, you would just do a, a, a dash AL uh, uh, list all, uh, and that would open up all of your uh, settings. There's a, is it, sh there's a shift command on Mac that uh, opens up Finder for showing all hidden files. I don't know, it's a shift something. There's a command that, that uh, opens that up for us too. Either way, I couldn't find our profile initially. So doing this every time you restart your session gets really old quick. Uh, let's be more efficient with our keystrokes. So you can go in and you can edit your R profile. In this particular section, I had a little, a few questions for us. So I'm hoping to have some interaction from the audience. If it does not exist on your computer, you can use, uh, uh, use DevTools and then it'll automatically create the .R profile. Once you have that open, the message that you're going to receive, it says, use DevTools. You'll get this uh, uh, note, include this code in your .R profile to make DevTools available in a, I think if I, yeah, uh, in all interactive sessions. So there's a caution note here, and I, I tried to uh, make this a big deal for us. You don't wanna continually add things to your R profile. Uh, they the author was commenting that uh, you could miss some dependencies if you uh, added additional messages in here or additional um, script details in here. What they wanted to add is this, if interactive, suppress messages, and then just require dev tools. The statement was that you can include multiple steps here, and that's where I'm going to get to my next code snippet down below. Once I added this in here, it just says, 
here's the location of where the uh, uh, .r profile was located. It's under the user directory. R Metcalf is, is my name. And then it created that uh, .r profile. So I went in and added this uh, if statement to that R profile. So the next time I restart R, I'm going to already be in that dev mode. That makes sense. Okay. So restart R for changes to take effect. I said, caution, warning, huge red flag. Please, please be careful here. I said, we're not all super persons yet. And I was trying to make sure that I didn't say Superman or Superwoman, uh, so I used a super person instead. But the uh, the idea is that uh, uh, use this was caught with caution. With great power comes great responsibility. In general, it's a bad idea to attach packages to your R profile as it invites you to create R scripts that don't reflect all of their dependencies via explicit calls to the library foo. But DevTools is a workflow package that smooths the process, smooths smooths the process of package development and is therefore unlikely to get baked into any analysis scripts. So note how we can still take care to only attach in interactive sessions. It has a logic here. The if statement is why it's calling that out. If you're in an in in interactive mode, then you will enter dev tools. Uh, that's a copy and paste from the book, by the way. I didn't change that or put that in my own words. Uh, I may be too harsh. Uh, the following is a good example when use this helps and can be added to your .r profile. So again, this is a uh, copy from uh, uh, the author. Uh, it says options, uh, use this dot full name equals Jane Doe. Uh, so we're giving ourselves an alias, whatever name we want to provide to the to the world uh, as the package developer. Uh, use this description and we're going to provide a list of author. Um, the person is Jane Doe. Uh, email is jane at example.com. Uh, I did make a epiphany. Uh, see, the role is either you're going to be an author or a creator. Uh, if you can give me just one moment, I'm going to jump out and go to the use this package uh, or maybe the that's in chapter four. Uh, I noticed where these tags were coming into the, uh, the users themselves. And then this ORCID. In another book club, I was trying to recall what the package developer's resume was. And uh, Jenny Bryant had put out this website of her profile as a package developer for our studio's uh, senior developer. And I couldn't recall what the name, but I, I kept saying it was a flower. I knew it was kind of like LinkedIn for package developers, but I couldn't remember the name of it. Um, and I knew it was a flower name. It was Orchid. Uh, so I'll try to find that link if anybody is curious and wants to uh, post about that. Okay. And the, the, the reference is your local, uh, your Orchid ID. Uh, you get a, a serialized number to your name. Uh, so you can put that in there. Others can find you in that manner. Uh, whatever license you have, and then whatever version number sequence you have. Now, the question I had in reviewing this was, does that version number change when you update or commit your package? Um, I don't know. Uh, that's it, To me, this is a static entry. Uh, so that gives me pause for, do I have to go update that every time? Uh, or does the system in commit or, or submission uh, automatically bump its revs? I don't know that. That was not a question I could answer at this point in time. And then the uh, protocol, uh, if we were to use it, just automatically calls SSH. Okay. Why did I spend so much time in this re regard? If you edit your R environment, if you edit your R profile, or when I get to chapter four and I start talking about the ignore, uh, build ignore package, uh, build ignore file, you want to be careful here because you're, you're actually under the hood uh, modifying the automated process of what our studio's intent is. So you're, you're, you're now kind of at a, a fine tune knob adjustments of how your R uh, session operates. Okay. All right. Keep going here. Uh, for the purpose, uh, for the history purposes, or at some point it may change uh, to explicitly call this out. We do dev tools, install GitHub, and then we have our lib dev tools. Um, this told me I didn't require it because I already had it installed. And then the other one was this uh, install GitHub rlib use this. And again, it told me I already had it installed, so don't worry about it. Okay. All right, moving on. Is everyone good so far? Any questions, details? 
Okay, good. All right, the R build tool chain. Um, call and remind me if I do get close to that, maybe five minutes before the end of the session time. Okay. Um, within the R build tool chain, any good developer must have a good compiler. All right, there's a multitude of different compiler options that are out there. The following three sections will expand on how these may be accomplished via the three main operating systems, and that would be Windows, Linux, or Mac. Uh, note at this point, there, uh, this may, these may not be required. The compiler options will become important when a source code, I just made a spelling error there, uh, become important when a source code contains either C or C++ code. It is very, very often as developers that we may drop into a more, uh, I, I, I don't like using the word eloquent, general purpose scripting language, uh, whether it be C or C++, um, you could access a wider array of uh, details within the management of your CPU or memory or whatever you're dealing with within a package development. Um, so it's not always a requirement to have a compiler. If you exclude having a compiler at this point in time, don't worry, it's going to remind you at some future point. Um, one of my favorite stories that went along with this compiler story was uh, Pandoc. Um, for whatever reason, my Pandoc was all sorts of out of whack. Uh, I was trying to load our markdown and the uh, book down packages. Uh, every time I would compile, I was getting these really crazy weird errors. Um, Colin, if you recall, that was in our master, Mastering Shiny, I think his name was Nate, that joined us for a brief period. Um, he was having a Pandoc issue. I know that uh, uh, at least uh, Frederica has had some Pandoc issues in the past. And the reason this is important is that you can build the package specific to the version of operating system or to the version of R that you're using. Uh, and so sometimes if you do this automated update packages and something gets a little bit askew, gets a little bit out of whack, it's not uh, associating with each other, you can go back and actually compile a version of that uh, service uh, to run within your environment. Okay, went a little bit too far down the rabbit hole there, but uh, compilers are really fun to deal with. Okay, within the Windows environment, uh, they have a service called R Tools. It is not hosted on CRAN, um, and it's not really directly related uh, to anything that you can find, uh, but they do provide a link uh, to go download and install it if required. Um, our tools is not in our package and therefore cannot be installed using some arbitrary install packages our tools command. Okay. During the our uh, tools installation, you may see a window asking you to select additional tasks. Do not, do not select the box that says edit the system path. It is implied that it should automatically put it on your system path for you. Uh, and then the second is uh, make sure that you do select the box for save version information to the registry. Okay. Uh, Colin, with your permission, I'm going to pause just for a brief moment. I have a quick story about windows and, and path variables. Um, windows has a tendency to allow you to do things that may or may not be normal. And I had a coworker that went in and completely deleted all of his path variables. Um, we had to build it from ground up uh, to associate and allow his command, uh, his uh, shell window to access all these sub programs. It was quite funny because he couldn't do a lot of automated features within programs like even opening a file would error out on them. So we had to reassociate a lot of these path variables. Um, and the whole reason that this is important is if, if you double click and you say add path in a older version of Windows, um, you had a tendency to delete everything that was there because it would automatically highlight everything. And if you started typing, it would automatically delete everything or it would, it would overwrite it. Just giving uh, uh, experience uh, to, to problems in the past. Okay, on the Mac computer, uh, we're gonna require the use of Xcode. All right, briefly talking about Xcode. <laughs> Xcode is a little greedy on your hard drive. Uh, if you install Xcode, it doesn't come uh, default on a new Mac. Um, you have to explicitly ask or install it. Uh, I do uh, use caution if you use Mac ports or Homebrew to install Xcode. Things get a little bit weird sometimes, so be very careful on package management of what you're selecting to load it. If you happen to use the Mac App Store, that's 
the more appropriate manner because it associates to your operating system. The point being is you have to have enough memory or enough storage, hard drive space to load and allow all of these simulated environments to also install. Um, I did a quick search just because I'm aware of this problem. Uh, they said the, uh, the current, if you were to uh, load the full Monty of all Xcode, it's gonna take up about 90 gigs of your hard drive. That's not required. You don't need that much space. Um, you don't need to develop an app for every version of the iPhone that's out there. Uh, so you can save some space by deleting some of those simulated environments. Uh, I do have a link here that gives instructions to go in and kind of trim Xcode down. Uh, you can safely get away with about 15 gigs and I don't wanna to be too opinionated, but I think that's even too much for a, uh, a scripting language or a or scripting environment uh, to take up that much on a, on a developer's hard drive. But at any rate, um, the third option would be Linux. Uh, and in this case, it's actually the easiest to load. Uh, the really, the only thing you need is to make sure that you have your um, R uh, code installed or R kernel installed, and then just include your development tools. And to do that, uh, I'm running a sudo app get update and upgrade at the same time. Uh, sometimes you can do that separately uh, if you so choose. And then the other option is just use whatever package management of operating system or, or uh, repo that you're using sorry, distro that you're using, and then you can do a R-based dev package and it'll, it'll install that for you. If you do happen to develop on Linux, I'm not telling you you have to. Um, some people are comfortable in Windows, some enjoy MacBook, not gonna uh, uh, contest with you or I'll support in any manner that you choose. Um, I'm just going to tell you things are a little bit easier in the Linux environment. And that does branch between uh, the various main distros within the Linux operating system. All right, after that's all said and done, we're gonna do a DevOps uh, site. I don't think it's sit, I think it's site. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a validation uh, that looks at your current environment and then makes recommendations on if there's any errors or changes that need to be made. Uh, for me personally, when I ran this, uh, it automatically prompted and said, hey, you're a little bit behind the power curve on your R Studio session uh, right now, excuse me, R kernel. It's at 411. Uh, you might want to upgrade to the newer version 413. Okay. It also gave me an error uh, that told me I needed to update two packages. I don't think it was booked club R packages. It was this color brewer broom and blob. And it was asking me to, to update some of these uh, dependent on that uh, particular service or that, that previous package. So this is where you get into some uh, dependency conflicts. Uh, if things are not quite where they should be, um, you are expected to have bugs in your uh, uh, development environment. I'm telling you that my current service that I'm doing to present this with and the, and the code output that I received, I am not in the perfect setting for this. Colin, are we getting close to time, sir? Uh, we're probably at 57, well, 56 right now. Okay. Um, I mean, I, it's probably best um, to stick with our hour and then um, probably just open up, up for any questions. Maybe we will get to chapter four next week. Rex, that means that we might have to push yours back and then everybody else will see kind of where we're at um, to maybe push back. If anybody hasn't, well, let's just open it up for questions and then we can kind of do some wrap up and stuff. So um, what, what questions do people have about for Ryan comments, um, just general discussion? Just out of curiosity, what, what operating systems does the group usually um, do their development in, if people don't mind sharing. I'm on a Mac. I use Windows, but I have um, uh, the GitHub actions to test it on all OSs when I push. Nice. Uh, Aaron says Mac, as well as says Mac. Uh, Larissa's on Mac. Ryan, you said you were on Mac. I actually have all three plus web. Uh, so I'm very agnostic. I, I have all three operating systems. I use all three. Uh, I would say I'm more competent 
on Linux specifically and by extension Mac. Uh, but yeah, I, I can use all three. Sweet. Cool. I just kind of wanted to get, kind of get a gauge of where people are at because I, I try and include Windows people in there too um, as much as I can because um, I know that people, you know, you know, people are more comfortable with it. So um, for people who are Linux users, I, I'll be 100% honest, like I understand how to use Linux, uh, you know, at a very vanilla flavor distro. So I'm not, I'm not in, in deep in that stuff, but I can at least enough to be dangerous with it. So, um, but I'll, I'll mainly kind of go towards Mac and try and sprinkle in some Windows stuff for people, so. I was gonna make a comment to that relation, uh, Colin. I discovered I was at a severe disadvantage in this uh, Docker Kubernetes environment that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I actually, IT was even asking like, why are you doing this on Windows? That's a weird environment to do this in. Uh, it's actually more native within that service and anybody that happens to watch the video and, and wants to come back and discuss that, I'd be more than happy to share my experiences thus far. Uh, I would rather do this on a, on a Mac or a Linux environment if, if uh, I had the option to. So. And then, I, I mean, the other thing too, is, is like, I've been, I've been exploring a little bit of like, uh, I mean, I've been exploring a little bit of different IDEs. Um, I've kind of gone down the route of maybe trying to do a little bit more terminal stuff. So people are interested in that. Like I'd be interested to discuss that more. It's really hard to get away from, cause I really love our studio and that's where I do most of my development time. But I've been kind of like doing like the Neo Vim, Vim stuff, but I know that's like out there. <laughs> so, but if anybody's interested in that stuff, like that stuff is kind of interesting to me as well. And it kind of goes down the development route, but it's real hard because our studio is is just a great product and a great IDE to develop in. So I have to quickly ask, is anybody an Emacs fan? Uh, does anybody here currently use Emacs? Um, I would be very, very interested just to be a mentor E uh, under your tutor, uh, tutelage uh, if you are an Emacs user. Uh, that particular environment, I have, I have completely lost uh, any connection to. Um, I look very foolish if I dump into Emacs. I can show you some Neo Vim stuff. I can't do Emacs, but it just takes so much effort, like to get it one to get it set it up and get it to work. But I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself and let other people join in the conversation. Anybody an Emacs user? Has anybody ever tried to use it? I've honestly never heard of it before. No, okay. Uh, Emacs is a is a is a very um, oh, I I don't even know if I would call it an IDE. It's it's that would even be a, a misnomer for it. It can be its own complete I don't know command center in its own right. You can do almost anything with Emacs. Uh, it's a it's an amazing uh, add on to to most Power Linux users. Uh, if you dump into Emacs, you can do almost anything with it. So the Vim it's, by thing, the, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Ryan, I mean to cut you off. I was, no, I was just gonna say, if you if you happen to use Vim or Vi, uh, Vi or Vim, uh, my favorite there is uh, once you get into the editor, it's very hard to get out of the editor. Uh, that's a, a running joke. The comment about Vi and Vim, the developer, I think Vi started it out, but, um, they wanted to be extremely efficient with their keystrokes. So all of your from homeroom, uh, home key row, home row keys, uh, you only have one finger uh, uh, space uh, of distance to type to do anything within Vi. Well, but it implies that it's a very, very efficient keyboard actuating to do anything, searching, adding, uh, 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 updating, et cetera within that text editor and it's all command line. So the, uh, in most cases, Vi will be with any Linux kernel that you operate with. So. Just so you know, you can do the Vim key bindings in your R studio. And oh, awesome. yes. And I will tell you, like, I will say, if you do spend all day coding all day long, if you make the switch to Vim and Vi, and again, 
if you want to. It, it, it there is some efficiencies in there that it's just it goes it can be it can be faster but it's one of those things where you just gotta like sink a lot of time in to learn how to do it um but if you're interested in you can set up your key bindings in our studio to mimic vim so i thought that was really cool, cool. blew my mind when i when i did it you'll never want to use a mouse ago. again no it's it's a yeah anyways that's a conversation for anybody who really wants to get into that conversation but um do you need to know that stuff to develop a package probably not but if you're going to get like if you're going to spend a lot of time coding and stuff it may be it may be worth learning so um i do encourage people to look into it if you want but do you need it not really so um cool well we're already at 903 i mean i can i you know i can hang out and kind of have a discussion with with anybody or we can talk a little bit more about some stuff if anybody wants to hang out um, but I think that's the content that we'll cover for this for this evening. Um, next week, we'll get to package structure and state. Ryan will be presenting. Rex, I'm thinking probably two weeks. And if you have an issue with that, just let me know. And other people, if you've already signed up for a time and we have to shift stuff, just let me know if a week's not going to work for you. I'll make the changes to the um, schedule. Um, obviously, the schedule is kind of fluid. So um, but if anybody has any issues that you can't present on a certain week or something, just let me know and we'll make those changes. But cool. If people want to hang out, I can hang out. If not, you know, everybody have a good rest of your week. And I look forward to seeing everybody next week. And if anybody wants to see Vim and how to work on Vim, I'm totally cool to hang out because I think it is the coolest thing out there. So, but. I'm going to head off, but thank you and have a good night. You too. See you, Brendan. Yes. yes Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Colin, I think cool. I'm going to head out as well, unless you want to nerd for a bit. I'm going to post a uh, link to Emacs. The, the reference that I learned in 20, 2009, 2010, I think is when I was doing this, I graduated in 2012 with IM, uh, ISM, and the whole program was done under Linux. I touched on Emacs briefly to realize, holy crap, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's where I kind of just stopped. It, it, I, I got my hands burnt, and I didn't want to go back and experience it. But um, uh, the other statement I wanted to correct, I don't think it's, uh, did you say it was Nero? You said it was Vi no, and uh neo vim well i call it neo i call it vim i thought it was nano a... i thought i thought nano was the right word well nano is another text editor that's oh it is available. okay yeah I so haven't... there's what the so heck? from what way i understand it there's vi well I, I i don't know if it's called vi or vi but vi was before vim vim was the updated version yep. then i think neo vim builds on top of vim and then ah. nano is a complete, I think, I, I don't know the, I'm just like getting into uh, it. Like I've I got never into heard it this before. I, well, ah. I've just gotten into this space, like probably six months ago. And okay. I don't know. I'm just one of those guys that I'm just one of those people that like the efficiency gains, like, yes. yeah, it's it, like, it's it, like it, it was a struggle. It's still a struggle. There's some times that I'm like sitting there and I'm like, man, how do I do this? But once you learn it and you practice it, you oh, just it's so much faster how much faster it is it yep. is bananas and like so the joke the joke is that it's not lazy you're not you're not lazy coder you are an extremely efficient coder and the the i was going to add one more statement but i didn't want to cut into the video the developer of i or maybe maybe it wasn't the developer but it was somebody later that was using that service the storyline said that they would literally sit at their computer and just do like very, very uh, short keystrokes, but they had everything mapped to this, you know, like Ansible workflow. Like they didn't have to do anything. You want a, a gallon of milk, it's one keystroke and it's already ordered and the wife can pick it up on the way home kind of thing. Like they literally just had everything in their entire life set up to just do these couple of keystrokes and they never left their computer. Now, I'm not, I'm not that engaged in, in uh, computer science or I'm not that, that, that much of a, a, a keyboard jockey, but um, I, I, I've always been fascinated with those users that are extremely efficient with their keystrokes. I, 
I was on the flight to California. Uh, I think we were flying into San San Francisco. I think it was Silicon Valley area. Anyway, this guy's on a Mac, and I I don't know if it was a music program that he was on, but it was some kind of this row of text. I've never seen this editor before, but the dude, as he was typing, was just like barely moving his hands, and he was doing these crazy like keystrokes, and but the whole screen was just like doing this amazing you know acrobatics, and I'm like the heck is he working on? Like what, what, what text editor is he dealing with? Never even seen the program before, but it's, it's okay. So I saw, like, I watched this one guy on Twitch and Mm -hmm. I think he's like, I think he's like, I think he's high up at Netflix. Like, I think he's like a a coder for Netflix. So he's like in it, right? Like he's like a real good computer programmer and he works mainly in Vim. Yep. And just, it's bananas how fast he gets through stuff. And I'm just like, whoa, like, it's just like next level. So the intent is, is most virtual machines or most Linux operating systems, the Linux kernel has uh, Vi or Vim baked into it. Like it's already there. Now Mm -hmm. you're going to be at a disadvantage because if you are starting to work in containerized workspace to minimize the size of that of that image that container they will literally strip some of those services away but um by default most servers will already have it there so it's almost implied if you're in a sysadmin or a devops type environment you got to know how to use the programs because that's the only text area you have it's a headless box there is no gui you know so well that's where i got introduced to all this stuff was because i was reading yeah. that like i was reading that mastering ubuntu book and it was just yeah. like just to just to see some of the efficiency stuff is just yeah. like crazy to me like mm-hmm. i couldn't like but the other thing is like um like the other thing was like you can you can actually set it up in our studio to have the vim key bindings like so like I so awesome. share yeah 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 because and i mean that's it's just so hard to get away from our studio i love our studio that's the problem and so it's like and it just takes so like, it just takes so long to get those stuff set up for like Neo Vim, sure. to like get even like half the functionality to do it. So, but like you can see how my cursor is here, right? It's yeah. like a different, but like you're you know everything is like, everything is set up, um, like everything is set up to do like the key bindings in here. So you're just using all of your keyboard to move around to change things up to like get the different like positions and stuff. And it's just like, it's awesome. So you can set up the Vim key bindings here if you want to learn it. But I I found some efficiency gains. There's still some stuff that I'm like still struggling with to like figure out. But like, if you, if you set up the Vim key bindings and you go um, double colon and type in help, it will pop up all the Vim keyboard shortcuts that you can use. Yep. It is just, it is just this, I don't know. And maybe because I just spent, maybe I spent too much time doing this all day long. So it's like, but like, I just found some small efficiencies. There's still some stuff I struggle with, but you have to kind of learn it and practice it to get good at it. But once you like learn it and get good at it, and I'm not going to say I'm good at it at all, but it's like. There was a, a podcast I listened to, and I can't, I don't think it was a Linux podcast. I think it was Python, like Python Bytes maybe, but they would always ask at the very end of the interview, of what is your favorite text editor? And the intent was you're either a Vi person or a Vim person, or you're an Emacs person. Mm-hmm. And it, it was this debate within the open source community that you're stuck on this one you know, era and you are definitely that person. Like you are you know, master of your domain concept. And the, the joke was always back and forth because I, I think the host was a Vim person. And so whenever they'd have an Emacs person, they'd always, you know, uh, give some flack back and forth. But um, that's a school of thought. I'll, I'll post a couple of links uh, talking about it. I would not, 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 not be comfortable explaining how to use it and and even how to install it. I, I that would even be a little bit of a stretch for me. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not even to that point. Like where I could just do all this in the terminal. Like to yeah. be honest, like it's yeah. like yeah, there's just so many things. And it's just like, the question is, is like, I have everything here. So how much do I really want to sink into it? Yeah. It looks cool. makes me faster Great. and I can learn yep. some cool stuff, but, and I can look cool doing it, but like, it's like, I have everything here. So it's like, 
it was it was a good compromise to figure out that she could put the vim key bindings here but just setting up everything to get it to work like you want it to is just a struggle and the other thing too is is like you're using open source stuff so you don't know i mean you know our studio is open source too but you know you're just trusting one person to make sure or a community of people to make sure that you're getting the same functionality as you would through our studio so it's like i don't know do you need to know it no but it's just kind of interesting to learn because it's really it's kind of cool to mess around with it but I well, know. I stopped. I stopped with the web development, or sorry, the 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 web, R Studio Connect, the open source web server version of R Studio. I stopped using it in Mastering Shiny because it had some really weird details that just wouldn't work, right? So if you're doing Shiny apps on a web server and you expect it to just automatically create another web server link, it doesn't work um, because by in by its intent, it is not a GUI interface computer, you don't have a browser option for it. So you almost have to, if you're doing shiny development, you have to have that uh, uh, close at home uh, to uh, to uh, access with it. But, yeah. Uh, and I guess the other thing that I want to get across to people is, is like, although I think this is cool and, and you can learn a lot of stuff. It's not required. It's not required. <laughs> you, like, you don't have to know with all this. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I find it really interesting and I want to like geek out about it, but it's sure. just like, it just, you got to like, you got to like love to be in it to learn to do that stuff. Cause do yeah. you really need it? Maybe if you're working at, like, if you're working at a big company, like, you know, Facebook and everything else, and you're right. based on like efficiency and doing things really, really quickly then. Yeah. But if like, you're somebody that's just developing like a package, you know, sure. but all right, well, I got to go Ryan. Right, so, yep, um, you bet. Hey, have a good, good, excellent job. We'll cover chapter four next week. And then um, we'll talk about kind of schedule where we're at next. So appreciate awesome. you taking on those duties and I'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Colin. Talk to you soon, All sir. Right, see you later. All right. All right, bye. Bye-bye.